up. Um, and so this is the double helical structure of, of DNA, right? We were talking about how there's a polarity. There's a five prime in. Okay, so we have a five prime end that has a phosphate on it. If you follow this around, it has a three prime end with an OH on it. Drop. Uh, and the faces are arranged sort of flat in the middle, sort of like a, a spiral staircase. So this was the model that Watson and Crick proposed in. 1953, uh, and it was one of the competing models. There were a couple of three helical models with the faces of these things sticking on the outside, right, and these phosphates on the inside. Um, and so this is what we know, how we, what we think DNA looks like nowadays, right? Here's our three prime end, our five prime end. The bases are complementary. A's pairs with T's, G's pairs with C's. And that's what Watson and Crick proposed. Right? All sounds familiar? Right? No? Sure, yes. Um, Yeah, what was the last letter or number or whatever that we had? And what was the two C or sorry. Okay. Double helix, double helix with what? Two? Okay. Two. Double helix, and we had A, B, and C, right? Somebody had to go and do some experiments with. Um, for that, 
Watson and Crick got the Nobel Prize uh, in 1962, uh, along with this number three, along with Maurice Wilkins, who was the guy that actually did the experiments to demonstrate that this actually didn't do the way to do the experiments. His lab did the experiments to prove that this, not that, I should say that, did the experiments that supported this hypothesis and disproved that three spiral structure of Pauli and, and Corey. So Maurice Wilkins was the other guy sort of involved in this. <coughs> so Watson Watson is the guy on the left. Uh, he's an American, James Watson. Francis Crick, he's a British guy over there on the, on the right. And Maurice Wilkins. In 1962, Nobel Prize for physiology or medicine. That's the actual name of the prize. Everybody just says the Nobel Prize for medicine. It's actually physiology or medicine. Um, and so this work was done to disprove the three-stranded hypothesis in Wilkins' lab, uh, and he got the Nobel Prize for it. But it really should have been the person in his lab who's doing the work. So a little secret about science is that the guys running the lab never do the actual research. They're the guys that bring in the money. The research actually gets done by armies of graduate students and postdocs and technicians. Uh, and anyway, the technician in Wilkins' lab was Rosalind Franklin, she's actually the one who did the experiments, designed the experiments, and did the experiments to demonstrate uh, or support that hypothesis. Um, she died before this Nobel Prize was announced. And so, because you cannot posthumously get a Nobel Prize, you can't get a Nobel Prize after you're dead, uh, they gave it to Wilkins. So she should really have gotten it. Um, number four, this strands of DNA <coughs> are what make up genes. So genes are just a strand of DNA that your cells read and turn that code into proteins, and we'll come back to that when we talk about genetics. But a gene is just a stretch of DNA. Those stretches of DNA form a long strand of DNA that fold up into chromosomes. A chromosome is just a strand of DNA with lots of genes on it. All these chromosomes make up a genome. So you, for example, have 23 pairs of these. That's not a very good picture. Uh, this, you have 23 of these, with all with genes on them. And that makes up all the genes in you, which is a genome. DNA makes up genes, a whole bunch of 
which is genes or a strand of DNA make up a chromosome. And chromosomes make up a genome, which is all the genes in an organism. back to that when we talk about genetics. <coughs> so nucleic acid is F, is that right? <coughs> F? Okay. So nucleic acids One was deoxyribonucleic acid, which is what we just talked about. The second type of nucleic acid is ribonucleic acid. Okay, if this is the base unit of a of DNA, what do we call this? Nucleotide, right? RNA is also made of nucleotides. Those are the monomers, the basic unit. Deoxyribose because it doesn't have an oxygen in here. This is DNA. So, one of the major differences between RNA and DNA is that RNA has an oxygen right here, this three, number three carbon, uh, I mean number two carbon. So, so it has a two prime, referring to the carbon, two prime oxygen, or two prime OH. That's what makes it ribose and not deoxyribose. That's sort of an accounting mechanism for the cell, so they can keep track of which one's DNA and which one's RNA. So just like DNA, there's a polarity to RNA nucleotides, right? We still have a 5 prime N and a 3 prime N. Just like DNA, you can string them together to make a polynucleotide. 
actually, let, let's go, let's, before we do that, before we do that, let's do the basics. So, there are four bases, just like DNA, and they're almost the same. They're A, G, C, B, but rather than a T, there's a U for uracil. So these bases still adenine, guanine, cytosine. Uh, the difference is still the same bases, but the nucleotides have an oxygen here and not an oxygen here. And rather than having T for this base, it has a U. I'll show you that. Deoxyribose DNA, no oxygen here, just two prime carbon. Right? And here's thymine. Here's uracil. This is RNA, so it has oxygen here, ribose, at this two prime. Right? But you can see that structurally, these two things are pretty close to the same. Okay, so it's not a huge difference. They look pretty much the same. Some minor differences, like this methyl group over here. Polynucleotide. Just like DNA, we can string A, G, G, not A, A, U, G, C, one right after another. But the big difference is RNA is only single stranded. doesn't form a double strand like DNA. We'll talk later about how full back on the cell to have parts of it that are double stranded, but for the most part it just is not double stranded. So if we list the differences between DNA and RNA, there are three major differences. One is DNA's deoxyribose, whereas <coughs> RNA is ribose. DNA has thymine, thymidine, instead of uracil. And DNA is double stranded. versus single-stranded. Um, so we'll come back, we'll come back to these differences and, and what effect they have on the cell when we talk about genetics. And we'll, we'll go over again how the cells are put together, or how the, how the DNA and RNA are put together. All right, so sort of following the, what's, how it's laid out in the book, we're starting from sort of the smallest units and working up to the largest units. So we started with atoms, we'll work up to ecosystems, so we've done atoms, atoms combined to make compounds, and organic compounds in particular. We talk about these three, or the, the five types of sort of major organic compounds, the macromolecules. So next step is to take those chemicals 
and combine them to make living things, to make cells. So that's going to be unit three. Genesis is this theory proposed that life came from <coughs> non-life. When they were talking about this, what they're referring to is, is small things like insects or uh, or bacteria, which have been discovered uh, or sort of described uh, 100 to 150 years earlier. So abiogenesis. Also known as spontaneous generation. You have the right conditions that inanimate things like a dead piece of meat will suddenly start producing things like flies. The competing hypothesis, or the competing theory, was, of course, the theory of biogenesis. And if you take that word apart and sort of parse out its meaning, that means life from life. Um, and over the previous 200 years or so, there have been some experiments that sort of had meant to address these, but it was still controversial uh, in the mid-1800s. In 1861, this guy, Dr. 
Louis Pasteur sought to disprove one of these hypotheses, or one of these theories. So Louis Pasteur was, by this point in his life, so this was, uh, I guess, 1861. He was already a famous chemist, uh, and he was head of the Paris Normal School. Uh, or actually, not that, no, the entire Normal School, the science division of the Normal School. What's a Normal School? Where all the normal kids go. <laughs> yeah, it's a school for teachers, right? Minot State used to be a normal school. And so it's meant to train teachers. He's head of the science department. Uh, and so he undertook this problem of uh, which was the correct uh, theory, abiogenesis or phylogenesis. Uh, and he carried out a set of experiments known as the swan neck flasks experiment. So, what he did was he took some, what's essentially beef broth, and he boiled it, and it's sort of this yellow straw color, and he capped it. And then another flask, he took the same thing, boiled beef broth, capped it, but this one had a straw in it. Right? And so what's the difference between these two? One's cloudy. Yeah, one's cloudy, right? Why is this cloudy and why is this not? It's exposed to oxygen. It's exposed to oxygen, this one is, right? What else? Well, the other one's boiled. They're both boiled. They were both boiled. They're both capped. This one has a straw on it. This one doesn't. Um, when was able to leak in bacteria? Right. So right. So this one's exposed to the air, bacteria. Things from the air can fall down this tube and colonize this one. Um, and so he presented this. Right. This is actually sort of a repeat of a, a pre previous experiment by. Uh, Spalzani, uh, but he presented this, and the criticism came back, well, this one is not exposed to air. They actually had, there actually was this different idea, another theory called phlogiston, that there was sort of this magical essence that was in the air. It wasn't sometimes equated with oxygen, sometimes not, but there's sort of some sort of animating factor in air, and this was not exposed to the phlogiston, and this was, and that's why living things could grow in this. So Pasteur's a pretty smart guy. He comes back with the following experiment. He repeats this. It's the same result. So what do we call this at that point? Control, control right? Control is all about expectations. He's done this already. He knows what to expect. If this didn't work out like he expected, he knew either he did something wrong, or his assumptions were wrong in the first place, or he did the experiment wrong. So he repeats this, but then he adds this. He adds a flask, also boiled broth, right? stoppered. But in this case, it has this swan neck shaped tube. And it stays clear. Why is that? The bacteria can climb up into it. No, the actually, just the opposite, right? The bacteria can't climb up into it. Because if they fall down, they get trapped in the arm here. But this stuff is exposed to air, or the phlogiston. So, if, so this is similar to this one, exposed to the phlogiston, except this stays sterile because the living things, the bacteria, can't fall down into here. So this is a swan, called the swan neck flask experiment. And it's the one that disproved abiogenesis that you have to have something living in order to create another living thing. Uh, and there's a couple of th extra steps he took. For example, he took a, one, a flask like this. and These are what his flasks look like. They're a lot prettier than mine. Right? So here's his swan neck flask exper experiment. He took one of these flasks, sort of like this one, and he snapped off the top. And what do you think happened to that medium? <coughs> got cloudy because the bacteria could fall in it. Now, the other thing he did was take one of these and tip it so that the liquid ran into the arm and then tip it back and it got cloudy. Right? Because the bacteria get trapped in here. So if we can move them to here, it'll colonize the, the medium.
let's do this. Let's do movie obscure. 
pasteurization. Yeah. Right? Cashier didn't care about spoiling the milk, right? He's French, he cared about spoiled wine. <laughs> Nowadays we keep milk. Uh, to 72 degrees Celsius uh, for 15 to 30 seconds. And that's enough to kill the bacteria, or lots of the bacteria. In the milk. Um, just to tell you a little bit more about the life of, of Pasteur, uh, in 1885, he vaccinates a little boy by the name of Joseph Meister against rabies. So he's one of the first people to use a vaccine. Uh, and he went on to He went on to uh, compete with somebody else to identify the sources of cholera uh, and uh, anthrax. Uh, and because of all these things, because of the, the Swan X last experiment and solving this wine and vaccinating uh, <coughs> Joseph Meister, uh, he's called, he's one of the fathers of germ theory, or infectious disease theory, same thing. Three was a, two was biogenesis, is that right? Okay. So I'm a microbiologist by training, so I'm going to show you my bias here. Life on Earth depends upon bacteria. The origins of life and the continued existence of life on Earth depends upon bacteria. Uh, so I want to give you a... Uh, brief history of life on Earth. I start. 4.6 billion years ago, or BYA. Okay, how do 
how do we know that it was four point uh, well, let's see, four point six billion years ago? Earth coalesces. That is, it forms. How do we know it was four point six billion years ago? Geology, uh, but I just sort of trust that geologists know what they're doing. Uh, and what they this particular uh, figure is looking at the radioisotopes, radiometric data from from nice rocks, which is a kind of rock in western Greenland. in Western Greenland, and it's looking how different elements decay into other elements, so uranium to lead, or different isotopes of lead, uh, rubidium into strontium, so a number of different elements decaying into other elements, and how long that takes, we can sort of back calculate, you can figure out how old these rocks are. So a number of different researchers have used a number of different methods and they all come up with rocks that are about the same age, about 3.6 billion years old. So you know the Earth has to be at least that old. And you can find similar rocks all the way around the Earth, right? So there's some in Australia, some in Wisconsin, in Africa, in Russia. You can find these outcroppings of rocks that are really old, about 3.6 billion years old. Um, turns out you can sort of backdate even further based on uh, asteroids that hit the Earth. But we know it's at least 3.6, on uh, mostly is closer to 4.6. I think we'll stop there. I'll tell you more about early Earth. Uh, on